Welcome back to the next part of our exploit development series. Today we are going to exploit the case that command from Wuln server and overcome some more space restrictions by writing our very own stager based on socket reusing. Right here we have the prefix check in the disassembly in IDA which we already know from the previous videos. Assuming that we set the prefix to case that we follow the red path and immediately jump into a basic block containing calls to malloc, string copy, memsat, and a function too. This shows that there aren't any checks in place, like in the last two videos, so we don't have to worry about adding certain characters or data to our buffer. Taking a closer look at function 2 shows that it contains a call to string copy as well, leaving us with two function calls that might be potentially exploitable with a buffer overflow. Since we don't have to conduct any further static analysis to bypass any checks, we can head over to WinDebug and start with the dynamic analysis of Wuln server. In WinDebug, we simply use G to resume the execution flow and then move to our Linux virtual machine to start assembling our exploit script. Right here, I already prepared a skeleton for our proof of concept, setting the prefix to case that and then adding a unique pattern string as a buffer to determine the exact offset for our instruction pointer override. After sending the buffer, we can move back to WinDebug and see that we successfully overwrote the instruction pointer with a value from our pattern string. To determine the exact offset, we take that value and then use it with MSF pattern offset to obtain the equivalent decimal value. Before moving back, let's quickly restart the application and use G to resume the execution flow again. Right here we can see that the exact match is at offset 70, so we can adjust our buffer accordingly and introduce two new variables. First the EIP, which will override the instruction pointer itself, and then a second buffer to check how much space we've got available after the override. Once again, we can send the buffer to the application and move back to it. As you can see, we successfully overwrote the instruction pointer with our hex 4.2s and to check how many bytes made it onto the stack after the override, we can use the display command together with ESP. As you can see, only 20 bytes made it onto the stack, leaving us with not enough space for any shell code. Of course, we can use some jump code to move the execution back to the beginning of our buffer, but there we only have 70 bytes available, which isn't sufficient for shell code, for example, a reverse shell as well. Because of that, we have to introduce a new technique to overcome that space restriction. In this case, we are going to write a stager based on socket reusing, which is basically the simplest stager you could write. An alternative would be socket reconstruction, which you can check out on guide attacking in my next article. For this exploit, we will first write some jump code to jump back 74 bytes, 70 bytes to move back to the beginning of our buffer and additional 4 bytes to compensate for the EIP overwrite itself. This would be the decimal value we need for our jump. And after jumping back to the beginning of our buffer, we will abuse or use an existing socket that was introduced by one server itself to receive our initial connection to start another listener and listen for our second stage, which will contain the actual shell code, for example, a reverse shell or popping a calculator. Taking a look at the receive documentation from Microsoft shows that we have four parameters and the one we have to worry about the most is the socket descriptor S. The flags can simply set to zero as we don't want to influence the behavior of the receive function in any way. The len parameter can be set to the approximate length of our second stage, which should be around 500 to 700 bytes, but we don't have to be that exact there. The buffer will point to a memory address where the second stage will be placed by the receive function, so we can simply add a few bytes to the current stack pointer at that time being to place our second stage buffer within our first stage one. Finally, the socket descriptor has to be obtained from memory as we want to use an existing one, and this might be a bit more complicated compared to the other three parameters. Moving back to our Linux machine, we first use the MSF NASM shell to convert our assembly instruction for the jump code to CPU opcodes. 
Next, we replace the placeholder for the instruction pointer override with a memory address that points to a jump ESP. This address was already used in the previous videos and can be obtained by using the search command in WinDebug and searching the sfunk library as A's address doesn't change. Next, we can execute our new script. And right here, we have the call to receive. Take a note at this address, which is the address containing the socket descriptor currently used, which is 110. Right here, we have the buffer address, the length, and the flex set to zero. From here, we can resume the execution, which will lead to the jump ESP, and from there to our backwards jump. Taking a look at that address, which stored the socket descriptor from earlier, we see that it was now overwritten by our jump code, which means we have to somehow find a solution for that. Now, if we can't, can't find another occurrence of our socket descriptor in memory, we have to come up with another technique. For example, the one I mentioned earlier called socket reconstruction. Luckily, there is another occurrence of the socket descriptor at offset 188 from the original one. And don't worry if you don't know about that fact, it will require quite some time to find it if it even exists. We can use the display command the current address and let's add let's say 180 and dump a few words from memory and right here we see that we got another 110 in memory of course that could be just coincidence that there is a 110 in memory so you should restart the application and double check if it still matches the original socket descriptor which in this case it does we can simply use that address and subtract the original address from it which shows that the offset is indeed hex 188 knowing that we can go back to our linux machine and start assembling the call to the receive function. First, we want to obtain the current stack pointer address by pushing ESP and saving it into another register. Afterwards, we will add the offset discovered earlier to AX in order to avoid null bytes here. To prevent any cluttering of the stack as we will push data to it, we will subtract an arbitrary value from ESP next. Following that, we will move the socket descriptor into EDX by dereferencing EAX, as the address pointed to by EAX will contain the socket descriptor. Afterwards, we will work on the remaining three parameters. First, simply the flags, as we have to push the parameters in reverse order. So we can use XOR and EAX EAX to zero out EAX and then push EAX onto the stack. That would be the flex parameter. And next we have to work on the length parameter, which we will set to decimal 512. Now to overcome null bytes uh, when writing shellcode, we often have to rely on some assembly tricks or alternatives. In this case, we will move hex two into the upper eight bytes of the AX register, which is called AH, which will effectively set EAX to decimal 512, but not generate any null bytes in our shell code. Next, we want to push EAX again to push the length parameter on the stack as well. Finally, we will push ESP again to get the current stack pointer address, pop it into EAX and add, let's say, hex 64 to AL, so the lower eight bytes, to generate a buffer address where our second stage will be placed. And that address will be shortly after our staging shellcode itself. Just like with the previous parameters, we will push EAX again. And finally, we will push the socket descriptor, which is stored in EDX. Next, we have to push the address of the receive function itself onto the stack. For that, we can move back to IDA real quick and double click on receive, which shows that the address is 004052C. Since we have a null byte here, we will once again use a little trick by shifting the EAX register by eight bytes to overcome those null bytes. First, we will move the modified address into EAX, which will be x 40252c and then we will append two bytes to it. It doesn't really matter which ones as long as, as it's not 00, zero as this would once again result in a null byte. To restore the original address of the receive function, we will now simply shift the EAX register to the right by eight bytes, and that will prepend two zeros to the address and get rid of the two ones we appended in the previous instruction. 
Finally, EAX now stores the address to the Winsock receive call and all that we have to do is call it. After converting the assembly instructions into CPU opcodes and creating a new variable called stager, which will contain all those instructions, our current exploit will look like this. Finally, all we have to do is replace our A's with some knobs to not break the execution and generate some shellcode. Before introducing the second send method, we want to adjust our buffer again by placing our stager between the prefix and our buffer and reducing the buffer length by the length of the stager. Finally, we will introduce our shellcode, prepend some knobs to it just to be sure, and then after a small delay, we will send our shellcode to the one server application. Now, to test our final exploit, we will move back to WinDebug, restart the application, and resume the execution flow. After sending our final proof of concept, we can move back and see that we successfully popped a calculator, meaning that our stager executed successfully, listened for another connection, which would then contain our actual shellcode and got that executed as well. Since explaining the whole concept of the socket reusing assembly instructions would require quite some time in a video, please head over to the guided hacking website and check out my corresponding article if something wasn't clear enough. Till then, I'll hope to catch you again in the next video where we will take a look at stack protections and how to bypass them.